Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome, members, to the seventh meeting of the Devolution for the Powers Committee. Um, can I remind members to switch their phones off or at least put them in the mode that won't interfere with the proceedings this morning? Um, I know that some members will need to leave to go and undertake other committee duties as later on in the, the process of this morning, so apologies on their behalf as they leave later on. Um, agenda item one involves taking evidence on the Scotland Bill uh, and the fiscal framework. Um, therefore, I warmly welcome the witnesses to the meeting this morning. Um, we have John Swinney, MSP, the Deputy First Minister, Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Constitution and Economy, Ken Thompson, the Director General of Strategy and External Affairs, and Alistair Brown, who is the Head of Finance. Welcome to you all. Um, welcome, Deputy First Minister. Um, thank you for attending today. I appreciate the fact that whilst uh, the negotiations are ongoing, uh, you've been prepared to attend in person this morning. Uh, I think the Deputy First Minister would accept the committee has been very patient so far in giving both governments a maximum amount of private time and space to reach an agreement on the fiscal framework. Um, we respected the position that there would be no running commentary, <coughs> although this means that as a result um, no parliamentary scrutiny to date has been able to be undertaken on the agreement itself. I'm sure you'll recognise that from both a committee and a parliamentary perspective that's far from ideal. The Scottish Parliament is being prevented from undertaking the necessary scrutiny work because of the delay in the agreement being reached. Uh, and obviously that situation cannot continue indefinitely. I, I know you, Deputy First Minister, you yourself have been a strong advocate with the, this, about this Parliament's role in scrutinising any deal you reach with the HM Treasury. And I'm sure you'll make that point to them and will continue to do so. But time is not on our side and dissolution is rapidly approaching. And I'm sure you'll appreciate we will have lots of questions this morning and we must finish our proceedings by 10 a.m. But Deputy First Minister, with that background, would you like to make a, an opening statement? Um, I'm grateful, Kavir, for the opportunity to update the committee on the negotiations around the fiscal framework and on other issues in the Scotland Bill. And I want to place on record my appreciation for the patience and the forbearance of the committee and the fact that an agreement has not been able to be brought before the committee for earlier scrutiny. Um, I intend to update the committee as far as I can this morning and subject to the agreement of the Parliamentary Bureau. The First Minister intends to update Parliament in a statement this afternoon. Paragraph 94 of the Smith Commission report recommended that the devolution of further tax and spending powers to the Scottish Parliament should be accompanied by an updated fiscal framework for Scotland. Smith also recommended that the Scottish and United Kingdom Government should jointly work together to agree this framework, and I have again engaged with the United Kingdom Government since March last year on this task. The Joint Exchequer Committee has met ten times to date, compromises have been made by both governments, and I remain fully committed to reaching a deal. I can set out today in broad terms where progress has been made and what further work is needed in order to reach an agreement. On the 7th of October, I set out to Parliament the areas where we needed to reach agreement as part of an acceptable fiscal framework. These were on the block grant adjustment for tax, on the implementation and ongoing costs associated with the devolution of welfare benefits, and securing additional capital and resource borrowing powers. I have made significant progress with the United Kingdom Government on a number of these issues. On the financial transfers to meet implementation and administration costs, I am satisfied that the proposals before us satisfy the Smith Commission recommendation that Scotland should receive a share of the costs. On capital and resource borrowing, again, I believe the proposals before us ensure the Scottish Government will receive the, the powers necessary to manage tax volatility and economic shocks, whilst also securing the additional flexibility to invest in infrastructure in Scotland and so improve our economic performance. However, we have so far been unable to reach a satisfactory agreement on the adjustment of the block grant for the new tax powers. This is due to a fundamental disagreement on the issue of no detriment. My clear position is that no detriment means that if tax policy and economic performance in Scotland remains the same as in the rest of the United Kingdom, then the Scottish budget should be no better or worse off, either at the point of devolution or in the future, than it would have been under the current funding framework. We accept that if the Scottish Government changes policy, or if our economic performance diverges from the rest of the United Kingdom, then the costs and benefits of this should fall on the Scottish Budget. But if nothing changes, then our budget should not change either, compared to what it would have been without the new powers. And similarly, 
the UK should be no better or worse off under these arrangements. I do not think there is any ambiguity in what the Smith Commission said about these vitally important issues. I have made it clear that I consider per capita index deduction to be the block grant adjustment mechanism that best fulfils the Smith Commission principles and that is fairest to, the, to Scotland and the United Kingdom. There is a clear consensus of support amongst academic experts and commentators for per capita index deduction as the method which best meets the Smith principles. Furthermore, the relevant committees of both the Scottish and United Kingdom parliaments have now endor endorsed per capita index deduction as the most appropriate mechanism for block grant adjustment. As I have said, this mechanism has also been supported by members of the Smith Commission from four of the five parties who took part. The UK Government do not agree with this definition of no detriment, and so far all the options they have proposed include varying degrees of detriment to the Scottish Budget. We continue to discuss the mechanism for adjusting the block grant with the United Kingdom Government, but I will only agree to a proposal which achieves the Smith principle of no detriment in a way that is effective, transparent and sustainable. To summarise the progress we have made, I believe we have reached an acceptable agreement on all issues with the exception of the key question, the method of block grant adjustment. The reason for this fact is there remains a fundamental difference on the principle of no detriment. I believe no detriment means that our budget should not be cut as a consequence of the devolution of these powers. The UK Government takes a different view. The negotiations, as you have said, Convener, need to conclude soon. I remain committed to sharing as much information as I can so that both parliaments have time to scrutinise the framework and the Scottish Parliament can consider it alongside the Bill and the Legislative Consent Motion. Uh, thank you, David, for uh, There has been progress. That's good to hear. Um, and obviously, we're now down to the area of indexation and block, block grant adjustment. <clears throat> the no detriment element had two elements to it, of course. It had no detriment to the Scottish position, but it also effectively said on the second element, I think if I got it right, there should be no detriment in regard to the impact on the rest of the UK. Um, from what I've seen from public commentary, the Scottish Government have attempted to to persuade the UK Government from the methodology that's been used that actually there, there, there would be no detriment for, for, the, for the UK taxpayer as a result of um, the proposals put forward by the Scottish Government. Could you walk us through that so we can, it can be a bit clearer to us? Because all we've obviously seen is the public commentary. Um, there are two Smith principles of, of no detriment. Um, the, the first is essentially the, um, the principle that I have outlined in my opening statement, um, whereby if uh, tax policy and economic performance in Scotland remains the same as in the rest of the United Kingdom, then Scotland should be no better or no worse off. And, con and, and equally, the United Kingdom should be no better or no worse off from the current arrangements. Um, th th there have been some issues raised um, about the application of per capita index deduction, whereby in certain circumstances, um, for example, if the United Kingdom government was to um, decide to increase uh, taxation, for example, in the rest of the UK uh, to pay for investment in the health service, uh, for example, um, that would be the raising of a essentially devolved tax, if it was to, if it was to raise income tax, it would be a, the increase of um, a devolved tax in the rest of the United Kingdom, which would create a Barnet consequential um, from which we would from which we'd be a beneficiary. And I accept that's, that that contradicts the second no detriment principle that was inherent in the Smith Commission report. So we've put forward um, uh, mechanisms that would temper that fact within the per capita index deduction methodology. So I've accepted that there is, uh, where there is a, an issue that creates essentially unwarranted gain for Scotland, that that has to be addressed as a consequence of the arrangements we put in place. It may be for the, the UK government to answer, but why have the Treasury not accepted that modified proposal? I mean, from your from, from your perspective, it, it is for the United Kingdom government to to explain their stance. I understand the Secretary of State for Scotland is coming to the committee um, later on today, and um, and uh, I'm sure we'll be happy to address that point. 
But I do come back to the, the, the fundamental question that we have wrestled with, which is the principle of no detriment. And um, fundamentally, um, we, are, we're, we are not in agreement that the, um, that the principle of no detriment means that uh, the Scottish budget should um, in no way be subject to systematic reduction as a consequence of the devolution of these powers. And that is the issue that we have wrestled with uh, throughout the uh, negotiations that have been underway. You might be reluctant, Deputy First Minister, to get into to some of the numbers on this, but there has been some public commentary, obviously. Um, in terms of the position that the, the, the UK Treasury find itself in now, uh, have, have the, have the Scottish Government made an estimate of what the potential impact would be on the Scottish budget from, their, from the most recent position from the Treasury? The approach of the United Kingdom Government has um, involved um, a variety of proposals and there have been public assessments made of what the implications of those uh, proposals would be. Um, uh, my estimate on the, um, the current proposals that we have from the United Kingdom Government in this respect is that we could be looking at um, a reduction in the Scottish budget of in excess of £2 billion over a 10-year period as a consequence of the devolution of these powers. And that, um, to me, was not what the Smith Commission was recommending. It was not what the Smith Commission had in its mind when it said there should be no detriment arising out of the devolution of these powers. And that is the fundamental issue with which we still wrestle. To Malcolm, just, just in, a, in a moment, Malcolm. Just, so just a, one other f f question. If the difference is could appear quite fundamental. Can a, de a deal be done? Um, and if so, I mean, have you any idea how long that might be? Or is that asking you how long a piece of string is? I, I think the, you know, what I've tried to do today is to demonstrate to the committee, and I just, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to reiterate it to the committee. Um, uh, on all other issues, I believe we are in a position of agreement. I would be in a position to recommend a deal to part the, the deal that is currently on the table with the exception that I cannot recommend the position that we have reached on the block grant adjustment. So um, I think a lot of progress has been made. There have been compromises on both sides to get us to the position that we find ourselves in now. Um, but the, the discussions about the block grant adjustment haven't just cropped up in the last 24 hours. They, they've, you know, they have been part of the discussion for the entirety of the 10 meetings of the Joint Exchequer Committee. And we have been wrestling with this same point for all of that time. So this is not a, this is not a new issue that's just cropped up. Uh, this has been a, a persistent issue with which we've been trying to uh, resolve the details. Malcolm. Well, thank you for that's been very helpful what you've said. I mean, I fully support what you're saying about per capita indexation because I think anything else but that will uh, erode Barnett and not deliver Smith. And that's the simple fact, I think, that uh, uh, I would like to repeat and I'm sure uh, everybody else would like to repeat as well. But I, obviously you've referred to some movement that you've been able to make in terms of concerns about the second principle about taxpayer uh, fairness I, I, and I think some suggestions were made by the Scottish Affairs Committee on that in regard to that as well is the proposal that that you've made in relation to the example you gave about extra spending on devolved areas in England is that is that the substance of that or is there anything else that could that has that you have offered or could offer that was consistent with the per capita principle that would um, help to um, I'll lay some fears if we have any legitimate fears. Could, could I make two points in response to Mr Chisholm? The first is to say that he is absolutely right to link this question to the Barnett formula because the, 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 the principle that the Smith Commission established in Clause 95.1 that the Barnett formula should continue to determine the, um, the, 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 the size of the Scottish budget. And that is essentially the test that we, that any mechanism must perform against. Um, the, you know, we can work out what Barnett would give us in terms of public expenditure. 
and any block grant adjustment must therefore be tested against that line. And if if it's flat as a pancake, um, then it's per, you know, then then it meets the test, and that's the that's what per capita index deduction does. It's flat as a pancake with Barnard. If you look at anything that delivers a lower line than Barnet, then that's detriment. And the proposals with which I'm dealing involve detriment. So Mr Chisholm is absolutely right to link it back to Barnet because that was the that was the commitment that was given um, in advance of the referendum. That was what was taken forward by the Smith Commission as Clause 95.1. It determines the, the test on which this issue has to be resolved. The second point that Mr Chisholm made was about um, what variation could be undertaken. The, the Scottish Affairs Select Committee, I thought, explored this issue um, very openly and effectively and brought forward some suggestions and also some questions about how per capita index deduction could be adapted to meet these particular tests. And I have um, offered uh, those mechanisms. Um, if there were other ways in which I could um, consider adjusting that approach uh, to try to um, resolve the issue, I would be happy to consider that. I don't consider that to be a closed issue. Uh, if there were other ways in which we could adjust the application of per capita index deduction to address any potential anomalies, I would be prepared to do so um, within the the consistency of the principles of the no detriment approach that was set out by Smith. I mean, it seems to me that the Treasury is behaving as the Treasury always does behave. I mean, in just looking ahead, I mean, does, does, the, does the Deputy First Minister see any um, any way of getting out of this impasse? I suppose uh, many people might think that it, it really needs to get the Prime Minister's attention and he's obviously occupied with other matters but I mean just looking at the week ahead are there any more meetings scheduled is, is there any suggestion that uh, the Prime Minister would get involved or because it, it, it looks as if as far as negotiations with the Treasury goes there's, there's an impasse. I, I want to I want to characterize the discussions as fairly as I possibly can do um, I think there has been um, a great deal of progress made in these discussions to the point that I can come before the committee and say that all other issues are resolved in a fire. I've not got everything the way that I would like it to be, but I think there is a perfectly reasonable proposition on the table on all other questions apart from the block grant adjustment. And the block grant adjustment issue is, in my view, at odds with the Smith Commission report. And I don't consider that I have the right to negotiate away what was agreed by my colleagues in the Smith Commission of all parties and what was set out as the uh, response of the Smith Commission to um, the challenge uh, that arising from the demand for extra powers after the referendum. So th th those, uh, th there has been a, 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 a a good effort to try to resolve these issues, but there is a you know there's a fundamental point of principle that we're not yet able to get across. Now, what is the the, the, the means of addressing that? Well, I, I, I'm pretty clear that we need to um, we need to see movement from the United Kingdom government on this question because I I don't believe um, I'm in a position to move away from the principle that the Smith Commission set out and what was in the mind of the Smith Commission when it formulated its recommendations. Stuart. I just want to, I think we're going to have a lot of this going back around the same questions but um, this morning, but I just want to be clear about the UK government's approach seems to be um, that they must find a, a formula which provides fairness for the rest of the UK taxpayers to sum it up. Um, and yet this morning you seem to suggest, the Deputy First Minister, that the, the per capita index deduction model plus the adjustments for any changes that the UK government might make to, for exa an example you gave us in health, if there was a, a change in uh, income tax in the rest of the UK which then went to health, uh, that you accepted that that would, uh, if it wasn't a change put in place, that would provide additional fund funding through Barnet which would not be fair to the rest of the UK taxpayers. So am I correct in saying that you've accepted that the 
per capita index deduction model with these adjustments that you would not accept uh, additional monies that would otherwise have come through Barnet for changes in taxation in devolved areas in the rest of the UK. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Right. I'm, I'm struggling then to understand, maybe it's me, but I'm struggling to understand why the rest of the, the, sorry, the UK government objects to that. That does seem to meet Smith on the one hand, but also seems to meet their argument, which is that we have to be fair to the rest of the UK taxpayers. I'm, I'm sorry I'm struggling, but I'm not understanding why they have a problem with that. I think the, the important point is, is in relation to um, well, two points in this respect. One is on the issue of tax policy decisions, which is the point that I've made in relation to accepting the um, where tax policy changes are driven by UK government actions and approaches, that we need to take account of that in per capita index deduction. That is exactly what we have done. I think the, 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 the second point, and I suppose the fundamental answer to Mr Maxwell's question, is um, in relation to the question of what is judged to be, um, to be fair in these arrangements to the rest of the UK. Um, the, the test of fairness that I'm applying is the test that the Smith Commission applied, which was that Scotland and the rest of the UK should be no better or no worse off as a consequence of, from, of the devolution of these powers from what would have been the position had these powers not been devolved. And that is essentially the test set by Clause 95.1 of the Smith Commission report in relation to the application of the Barnett formula, which of course was one of the central commitments uh, of the vow made just days before the referendum. Um, and uh, I simply want to make sure that we are consistent with what would have been delivered under the Barnett formula um, and um, the, the UK government takes a different view. So the UK government's position is that Smith seems to be clear that the, the agreement reached was that it, it's not the devolution of the power itself that causes changes, it's the use of the power that causes change. And therefore, the, U, the Scottish government could be better off or worse off on the basis of that change, and you would have to live with that risk or that benefit. Um, I accept that essentially there's two stages to this. Um, from the devolution of the powers, um, I believe, and I believe I'm well founded in this view from the Smith Commission conclusions, that we should be no better or no worse off as a consequence of the devolution of the powers. The second point is when we then exercise those powers, if there is a revenue gain, then we get to hold on to it. If there is a revenue loss, then we've got to deal with the consequences of that. And that's, that's the principle of fiscal responsibility that's also um, inherent in the, um, in the Smith Commission report. Um, so there is a difference between the devolution, from the devolution of the powers to the exercise of those powers and the living with the consequences of exercising those powers. If a, if a future Scottish government, <coughs> let's assume for a moment those powers were devolved, um, and a future Scottish government did nothing to change the taxation levels in relation to what the taxation levels were in the rest of the UK, then under the model being proposed at the moment by the UK government, what you're saying is the Scottish government's budget would fall by, I think you said, two billion over a period of 10 years. That's so by good. doing nothing, effectively we end up in, a, in a, a situation where a budget is cut by two billion over that period of time, as a consequence of, just of acquiring the these powers, just which and I and I, I don't I, I don't uh, believe for a moment that the members of the Smith Commission were taking the view that when they were arguing the for the devolution of these powers and the application of the principle of no detriment on the devolution of these powers that the Smith Commission had in its mind that there should be essentially an automatic reduction in the budget of the Scottish Parliament as a consequence. Okay. <coughs> Tavish Scott. Thank you. Um, can I agree with the um, tenor of, of your remarks, Deputy First Minister, on uh, the process being all but agreed, other than this one point of fundamental disagreement? I think the committee very strongly understands that. In that context, has the First Minister spoken or or discuss that with the Prime Minister, as Malcolm Chisholm was asking earlier? There, there, uh, there has been a discussion between the First Minister and the Prime Minister, which took 
place, um, I think about 10 days ago, if my if I'm correcting my dates, if I, if I need to correct that, I will do, but it's of that order. And um, obviously there has been um, more recent discussion with the, the Treasury. Um, I um, was in the Treasury on Friday. I met with the Chief Secretary and with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And um, yesterday I had uh, further telephone conversations with both the Chancellor and the Chief Secretary. But do you think it was fair to suggest to you earlier on that the way in which this fundamental disagreement is going to be resolved is at that level, is at First Minister and Prime Minister level? Yeah, I think, I think that, that that's, that's, in my view, other than parliamentary scrutiny and parliamentary sure. discussion, um, the, the, the other channel that exists to try to resolve this issue. Thank you. And, and would it be fair to assume, therefore, that when the, Prime, the First Minister updates Parliament this afternoon, she'd have something to say on that, given that's obviously the one area that does need to be resolved? Yes. Thank you. And the other, other question I wanted to ask is, I'm trying to, again, like other colleagues, understand what, what's the, what the Treasury's position is, and you're right that we can obviously ask the Secretary of State that later today, but um, at any time, have they played in the changes that are going on within England that, in particular, the Chancellor is making much of? Does that have any bearing on the financial model and the uh, per capita, um, the specific per capita discussions that have been taking place? It, it, Mr. Scott will appreciate that I, you know, I, I, I'm trying very hard to be open with the committee, but without um, breaching the, the 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 nature of the negotiation process in which I have been involved. But I think I can surmise that the United Kingdom government has in its mind uh, the implications of what may be agreed in this particular discussion for other parts of the United Kingdom. So I don't think that's, I don't think this is a unique process. No. Right. Thank you. Duncan. I think, I think Tavish got to it. I think uh, maybe rerun it again. Um, within this context, there is an agreement within reach. There's still the big difficult bit to go. Do you see your role in that complete now? Um, do you have uh, space in your diary? This, well, do you have space in your diary put aside this week to have further talks on this issue? And what date does the uh, First Minister have in her diary to this week to meet with the Prime Minister? I, I would want to make it clear to the committee that the, the government will, the Scottish government, ministers, the First Minister, myself, will make ourselves available for any conversation that is required to try to advance these discussions. I think. Um, uh, you know, I don't think anybody could lay a charge at me that I've not allocated the necessary amount of time to try to resolve this um, at um, great inconvenience. If, if, if Mr McNeill wishes to consult with my constituents who were expecting to see me on Friday and who did not see me on Friday because I went to London to pursue these discussions, um, he'll understand the sense of priority I've given to this particular issue. I wasn't the work that you've put in. I, I was suggesting that you've taken it as far as you have possibly taken it. I'm just taking your remarks on what you've said this morning. I'm looking for this next closing stage and what we'd expect from a negotiation like this, where the Prime Minister and the First Minister come together. When this week are they coming together to close this deal? I, I, uh, I, uh, I think there will be... Uh, discussions will be pursued to try to do that, um, but I can't give the committee. I can't give the committee any fixed dates on that question. Mark, uh, <coughs> thank you, convener. Um, <coughs> there's been some suggestion from some quarters, um, Deputy First Minister, that um, essentially a means of breaking the impasse would be for the Treasury to essentially say we will underwrite any shortfall. Uh, in the in the Scottish funding, and we can review it all after a three to five year period. What's your take on 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 that position that's been advanced? The question really relates to what is the um, what is the underlying method of block grant adjustment? And in all my discussions on this question, I think I've I've come ever more sharply to the view that that issue cannot be fudged. It cannot be put off, because if you put it off to some review at a later stage, without knowing what is the uh, what is the the reference point or the anchor point for the block grant adjustment, um, then you have uncertainty about what the block grant adjustment 
would be. And I don't think that's a, uh, I don't think that's a stable mechanism, which is the type of requirement that the Smith Commission put uh, upon us. So you, your, your view would be that um, what, what needs to be put in place needs to be sustainable in the long term. It, it can't be something that's put in place in order to get a, a, a deal done uh, and then we'll all come back to it in five years' time. And if it hasn't worked the way it was uh, intended by Smith, we can unpick it. I suppose that opens up future risk in terms of who's going to be around the negotiating table at that stage as well. I think there has to be a, a very clear understanding of what happens if, 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 if an issue was to be um, put off to a review at a later date. There has to be a clear understanding of what happens if agreement cannot be reached at that stage. And if there is not a clear understanding of what happens at that stage, that breeds uncertainty within the um, the, the details of what would be the financial framework that underpins the devolution of these powers, and that would be a significant increase in the risk that would be carried as a consequence. Mm -hmm. And I guess the sort of follow-on from that would be, uh, in terms of what the UK government is continuing to put forward, and, and we've kind of discussed the the, the no detriment issue. Has the has the chief secretary outlined in detail what? His understanding of no detriment is. I mean, you've give, you've been very plain to us today about what you what you see as no detriment. And I think that would be the, the the view that this committee has taken of what no detriment is. Has the chief secretary given an understanding of how he interprets no detriment um, from from his perspective? Given that he obviously is at odds about what it means. Uh, y yes, he's given a, a very clear explanation of his view of, of no detriment. Yes. And just before we move on to another area, the. The key issue for this committee is going to be when more information is going to be available for us to scrutinise the agreement. Now, I realise that there's no deal till everything's sorted out, but obviously there's a lot of information there available that's, or the areas of agreement that already exist. Now, that may be an agreement by two committees, by two governments, but this committee still has not agreed that, that, would, that these areas are areas that we're satisfied on. So I just wonder how soon we can we can see some of that information so that we can begin as a committee to make a judgment on whether or not the areas that have already been agreed on that we find these acceptable. I have to preface my remarks in this in response to your question, Kavina, by saying that uh, you know, I've tried to, to give the committee um, the clearest possible sense of what, is, what are the remaining issues in relation to the uh, the, the resolution of this issue, and it is in fact the, the block grant adjustment as, as I have set out. I think it would be, uh, the committee has to understand that I'm not suggesting there is a, an agreement here already. Nothing, as you have just said, convener, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. But what I'm trying to say to the committee is that um, if we could resolve the block grant adjustment issue, I would be able to bring forward an agreement to the committee really very quickly. But I have to be realistic with the committee that if I cannot resolve the block grant adjustment issue, then I cannot see how I can bring a wider agreement to the committee for scrutiny. And I can't bring part of the agreement to the committee for scrutiny because nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. I yeah, understand that point. The final question I'd ask before I go to Stuart McMillan would be, and if there is no agreement, um, will you publish the papers at least so we, we can understand the detail, even though there's no agreement on the table? Yeah, I, I've, I've committed publicly that I will publish all uh, documentation that's relevant to the discussions before dissolution of Parliament. OK. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Deputy First Minister. Just, just a couple of questions just regarding the, the fiscal rules and borrowing. Uh, also, I've, I've listened to what you've said this morning, uh, and it, it certainly uh, things certainly have progressed in this particular area. But I think one of the underlying features uh, of, uh, of the whole fis uh, fiscal uh, arrangements uh, should be around fairness. Now, you did say that, uh, that there has been... Uh, both sides have uh, compromised on a number of areas. Uh, and uh, are you in a position to provide the committee with uh, any details in terms of any levels of compromise that have, under, that have been undertaken by both sides uh, on, the, the, on the issues of the fiscal rules and borrowing, please? I, I'd, I'd prefer not to go into 
detail beyond what I've said, um, other than to say that I believe that the um, position that we have reached on capital borrowing provides us with increased flexibility in relation to the, um, the, the undertaking of capital investment activity. And on resource borrowing, I think um, additional flexibility has been generated to enable us to deal with both economic shocks that are Scottish specific and um, the issue of tax volatility, which will be an, a, a, a more significant consideration for the Scottish Government in due course. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the, the discussions, um, have discussions between the two governments included uh, whether or not the, the UK Government should have a, should have a particular stance on uh, on the bailing out of the Scottish Government if this were required? Um, it's not terminology that I would recognise. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, I'm very clear uh, that the we operate within fiscal rules under the current arrangements and they are obligatory fiscal rules. Um, if there are a different set of fiscal rules that were to apply with the acquisition of new powers, then we would have to operate under those obligatory fiscal rules and to make sure that we lived within them and that the parameters of fiscal flexibility, particularly in relation to resource borrowing, should be sufficient to enable the Scottish Government to exercise fiscal responsibility and we should be uh, we should be prepared and, and able to do that in all circumstances. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And Duncan said that might be David Cameron for him. Um, on the borrowing thing, before I come to, to Tavish, Scott, on, in general terms, I realise you can't go into some of the detail, obviously. Our committee had a preference in a report that we produced for an, a, a prudential borrowing regime. It'd be in that particular sphere or is it more about higher borrowing limits being available to a future Scottish Government? Can you go that far? Um, I, 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 well, the, 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 the borrowing arrangements, um, which I consider to be satisfactory, uh, are within the context of um, a framework for borrowing which is not prudential. Okay. Tavish. Can I just ask, you answered the convener earlier on by saying that you would publish all the papers prior to dissolution were there to be no agreement, um, which begs the question, if there is no agreement, is that it? Is the bill dead? What does happen at that stage? Because presumably whatever government is elected after may, I would have thought, want to take forward and try and reach agreement. What's your perspective on what happens if we literally do achieve nothing before we all cease to become elected members? Mm. I think that's uh, it's a particularly difficult question. And um, I think that uh, you know, the issue is most easily resolved by getting to a fiscal agreement about that. And I think the, and I, and I don't think we should delude ourselves that the issue becomes any easier After this the later it goes on. Mm. Um, I, I think it just becomes, it just mm. the, the, the discussions, in a sense, just become more prolonged and protracted potentially. So uh, my hope is that we can resolve these issues and resolve them timorously so that we can uh, proceed to, to give ledges of consent on the Scotland Bill. It's always been my position that that was what we should try to do, but uh, I know that the committee will understand that um, that has to be on an acceptable basis. And I agree with that, and I think we all do. Um, and would uh, just on Duncan McNeill's point, therefore, is it, is it this week, this make or break? I mean, we're all under enormous pressure now in terms of time, not least of which the government itself. But well, I, is this I, I, week it? Uh, through, throughout the discussions with the UK government, I, I have been um, stressing the importance I attach to making sure that Parliament has the opportunity to properly scrutinise this arrangement. I have felt distinctly uncomfortable uh, for some considerable time about the fact that I have not been able to open up this process to scrutiny. It's not the way this institution works. It's not the way I've been... Uh, I, you know, I've been uh, essentially uh, experienced parliamentary scrutiny. Um, this is a very open institution and I've not been able to fulfil that and that's been profoundly uncomfortable for me for some considerable time and I'm 
I feel I have absolutely no alternative today but to share some detail. There may be some exception taken to the amount of detail that I've shared with the committee this morning, but well, I'm afraid that I'll just have to be lived with because I can't see how I can sit here and not answer the, qu the committee's reasonable questions on this point because I think it's so, it's so important that Parliament has confidence in the arrangements that, are, that have been negotiated on its behalf and free, mm -hmm. if Parliament judges it, to say we don't believe these arrangements are strong enough or appropriate enough. Mm -hmm. And I've, and I have, you know, I am very mindful of parliamentary opinion. Um, I, I can listen to what members have said. I can look at what committees have said for a sustained period, and um, I am aware of what Parliament expects to see from this agreement. I'm confident that on all issues other than the block grant adjustment, I've got um, a set of, of proposals that I could confidently defend with Parliament, but I am I, I, I could not defend um, the proposals that have been put to me on block grant adjustment other than the, the ones I've advanced on per capita index deduction. Well, we'll, finish, we'll move on to areas of welfare now. I think it's fair to say at this stage, though, given your comments there, Deputy First Minister, that this committee just can't be in a situation where we're rubber, rubber, rubber stamping something at the end, and I think you accept that from the comments you make. We need to make these points later to the Secretary of State. It's imperative that we're able to scrutinise the detail of this agreement. And I think, we, we, I think we, speaking on behalf of the committee, we'd all be very anxious that we weren't in that situation of simply rubber stamping, because we need to put a, a considered report with lots of detail in front of the Parliament, so parliamentarians have the chance to examine the detail, and, uh, and we'll leave that point, that particular bit of questioning at that stage. And Linda, you want to move into areas of welfare? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Deputy First Minister, it seems quite clear, both from what you've said today and from what uh, we have heard in evidence to this committee, that the, neither the spirit nor the substance of the Smith Agreement is being met in, in terms of block grant adjustment. Uh, you said that you had um, recognised that there had to be compromises on both sides on, on other things that you feel have come together. Can I ask whether in terms of both welfare and uh, the work programme, and both of these things have impacts on the other, um, whether you feel that the potential agreement you've reached on that uh, meets the spirit and substance of the Smith Agreement? One of the um, issues in relation to employability support is the fact that since the Smith Commission agreement was made in November of 2014 um, and a commitment given to devolve um, employment programmes, particularly the work programme, the United Kingdom government has changed its policy position on these programmes and has particularly reduced the amount of funding that is being allocated in at that respect. Um, that quite clearly um, has um, been an issue of concern for us because, again, in November 2014, the prospect of devolution of employability support was a greater prospect than what essentially is proposed to be devolved by the UK government when the, the, the process um, it comes for devolution at some stage in the future. So there is a, a diminished proposition on employment support than what we would have imagined was the case when the Smith Commission reported in November 2014. Uh, that has been a, a, an issue of discussion um, with the United Kingdom government and one where, um, I, you know, I'd have to say I, I haven't got all that I wanted, but I, you know, I, I'm prepared to live with the consequences of what uh, has now been of, of where we've reached on that issue. But have we got better than the Pretty Patel's argument to us in a letter that said the budget would be reduced by 87%? Is that, is that still the area we're in, or is it? Yeah, that, 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 that is still the area uh, roughly that we're in, Gavir, yes. Well, yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, so, so quite clearly, um, neither the spirit nor the substance in that regard was met. I think that what I'm, what I'm trying to, to, to say to the committee this morning is that there is, um, there's not, in all the issues that we've looked over, um, we haven't managed to reach um, a conclusions that are perfect from my point of view. 
but uh, you know, in in the round, I'm prepared to look at them and say, well, that looks to me to be a reasonable set of propositions. And we've broadly, you know, got to that position on a whole host of questions. Um, but the block grant adjustment remains the standout issue, which is of such significance that I, uh, you know, I, I I couldn't in all faith say good faith say to the committee, um, I'm going to hold this deal up because of employability arrangements. I'm yes, not, I'm yes. Not, I'm not ecstatic about them, but. You know, I I'm think you were ever up. reasonable, Mr. Swinney. Um, can, can one of the things that um, w was of general concern on, on the Smith Commission was that um, there should be no, to use the heightened trade, detriment uh, to individuals as a consequence of taking over powers on welfare. And indeed, there was the view that we should be able to create and top up. Um, can I ask if you feel that... Um, the potential agreement reached matches these things. And certainly, on the um, since we, should, we 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 move over on this question, I think more importantly onto the contents of the Scotland Bill. And in this respect, I think the the uh, latter clauses that were added to the Scotland Bill by the Secretary of State in the House of Commons. Um, House of Commons. Yes, I think it was the House. Of, yes, it wasn't the House of Commons. Um, where um, gave us the necessary flexibility to enable, to enable us to do that. So I'm satisfied with those legislative pr provisions. And uh, clearly, uh, we have to make sure that all necessary financial arrangements are in place to make sure that these powers could be exercised. W would it be fair to say um, that's all fine in one regard, as long as you get a reasonable and fair settlement matching the Smith Commission on adjustment of the block grant. Um, without that, everything else would be up in the air. Well, that, 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 that is why it is so important that we recognise the equality of significance of both the Scotland Bill and the fiscal framework. And um, we cannot give legislative consent to the Scotland Bill without having a fiscal framework that enables us to know how we would, the basis upon which we would be exercising the powers in the Scotland Bill. So um, I, I accept entirely the point that Linda Fabiani makes that there has to be um, a, an acceptable fiscal framework in place to enable us to exercise those responsibilities. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the headline top stuff affects the individual. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm sort of following on from Linda Fabiani's questions. Has there been any movement when it comes to welfare administration costs? Because it seemed there was a considerable gulf there to be bridged. The uh, Treasury, the HM Treasury, were estimating that only 50 million was needed to cover all transition costs, whereas the Scottish Government felt that ongoing administration costs for a devolved welfare <coughs> system might be in the region of 200 million upwards? Um, we've reached uh, a position that I consider to be acceptable on the uh, implementation and operational costs as arising from the devolution of these responsibilities. So there has been some positive movement there um, that, you, that you feel will be acceptable to Parliament. Um, can I, obviously the acquisition of new powers to the Parliament involves ever closer working with Westminster. And the committee spent a not inconsiderable amount of time looking at intergovernmental relations. Do you feel that this has been a, a positive experience? Are you content with with the way it's been going? Um, I'm not. <laughs> I, I, it, it's quite a question to, dis to to consider whether it's been a positive experience or not. <laughs> um, it's certainly been it's certainly been the experience. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Um, I, I think this, we have to. I think we've got to see this. This is not just about intergovernmental working. This is also about a negotiation. And negotiation of its nature is not going to be um, um, a straightforward or easy process. So there have been, you know, there have been some tough issues to crack. And I think we've actually managed to crack a lot of those issues. And it's involved a compromise on my part. It's involved compromise on the part of the United Kingdom government, and uh, and I welcome that, and um, and we've got very far along the process, uh, but um, there remain outstanding issues that, that have to be resolved. And I think what I've been anxious to do is to also make sure 
the, in the intergovernmental, where, where we stray out of negotiations and into intergovernmental working, that we have in place mechanisms that will satisfactorily and effectively ensure that we can undertake good intergovernmental working to advance uh, issues that will require a lot of joint working to implement um, the details of the Scotland Bill and the details of the fiscal framework. Thank you, Convener. Rob. Uh, I would like to pursue this a bit because clearly if uh, the set-up costs and the running costs of uh, the Welfare Administration um, are greater than you expect in any deal that can be reached, then there has to be some means uh, and some time scale in which these can be reassessed. Now, that and many other things, you know, beg the question following on from what Alison Johnson has said about a review period given the agreement that uh, could be reached in the next short period and its implementation within the next two or three years. Has there been any discussions about how that might take place? On the question of the the, the, the nature of the fiscal agreement. I, I've very much had in my mind the requirement of the Smith Commission that we should be um, agreeing arrangements and then not constantly revisiting them, I think is the best way I could summarise the Smith Commission agreement. So I've been trying to get to sustainable arrangements which, um, which would not require to be reconsidered. So when I, for example, have signed up to, well, when I, when I use the term signed up to, insofar as I've signed up to anything, um, we reach a point of agreement about the implementation, the setup costs and the implementation costs on, on welfare administration powers, for example, um, I consider that to be closed. So that's then up to me. If it costs us more, then it's an issue I've got to resolve as the finance minister. If it costs us less, then we've managed to operate something more efficiently and we've got a, we've got a gain out of it. Um, I certainly, if it costs us more to implement administration of these matters, um, I, I, in all good faith, I could not go back to the UK government and say, look, I need you to reopen this issue because I, you know, I've entered into the negotiation in good faith, we've got the agreement and that's an end to the matter. So I think the, the, the only question of review has come into the question of trying to make progress on the block grant adjustment. But I dealt with questions from Mr Macdonald earlier on about what, what, what we have to have be mindful of in entering into a review on some questions in relation to the block grant if we do not know what would be the basis for resolving any disagreement about uh, the nature of the block grant adjustment mechanism that might prevail um, uh, should there be no agreement in that review. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Deputy First Minister, because Alec John Alison Johnson, in fairness, asked you a pretty fair question in terms of the amounts of money were involved in welfare administration. Now, you've compromised, you've told us pretty significantly already in terms of the employment programme area with a reduction from £53 million to £7 million pounds in terms of what's available. So there's a compromise being made there, understand that. There's obviously some level of compromise being made in the level of, in, in regard to the administrative costs on welfare. Um, for this committee to understand just how much... This is the tone of the negotiation I'm trying to get to here, because you've compromised there. You've, there's obviously been some compromise in the area of welfare um, administration. I think it would be fair for the committee to understand a bit more about what the scale of that was, because we need to make a judgment at some stage. If you've been reasonable in compromising, well, well, we can ask the Secretary of State later, what have you been reasonable in compromising on to get to a deal? And I think that's so to enable us to be, get to that situation, though, being able to have more information from you on that area would be very helpful. Um, I, I I don't think I've placed on the record the numbers that you've said about employability, convener. I think I've been careful to say that um, the issues are of, um, uh, uh, you know, there's no change in the UK government's policy position on the uh, approach to employability support. So I've been 
careful not to put specific numbers on the record, and I don't particularly feel keen to do so today. Those numbers I was using. Okay. Um, the, 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 the point I'd make in relation to um, the, the, the the welfare administration issues is that the Smith Commission um, recommended that we, there should be a share of these costs um, paid by the United Kingdom Government, and uh, that is the outcome that we've been trying to secure, and um, we have secured that out, an outcome that's consistent with that definition. Okay. I'd like to push you further, but I know that's not going to get me any further in that area, but it would help us get, you can, I'm sure you understand, to understand the tone of negotiations would have helped us. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I, I think it's, I, 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 can, I can help the committee insofar as to say that um, I have not got everything that I wanted out of this process. Um, now, I'm sure the United Kingdom government would say the same thing. Uh, I'm sure there's things that they have, you know, would rather not have had to have agreed with me about it. But the Secretary of State, I'm sure, can give the committee a flavour about that. Um, uh, you, well, you've given this indication the areas where you've been compromising and being, and being reasonable. We'll see what they say later on this evening. Alec Johnson. I was just going to say um, something that you might expect me to say, and that is, is it not fair to say that you built in plenty of room for compromise in your initial figures? I notice that the estimated costs of, uh, for welfare uh, set up costs of up to £660 million. Now, less than two years ago, Alex Salmon was telling us he could set up a whole independent Scottish administration for under £200 million. Uh, so surely you built a margin in there that you could negotiate away. Well, let me just say this. Um, the, the Department for Work and Pensions estimate that the set-up costs for the social security arrangements um, involved in the Scotland Bill is £350 million. Pounds. And what has been agreed as the UK government's contribution towards that is less than that figure. Am I, am I correct in saying that figure is £50 million. That's been the, comment Pardon? the commentary has been that it was £50 no, million. No, the Department of Work and Pensions estimate of the cost of establishing the systems um, the, the set-up costs right. under the Scotland Bill were £350 million pounds, and the agreement that I have got to with the UK Government on their contribution to that one-off um, cost is less than that number. Okay, that's helpful. Satisfied, Mr Johnson? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> In that case, we'll go to Rob Gibson. I think he wants to ask a question around Crown Estate. Yes, yes, indeed. In the Scotland Bill context, uh, this committee has written to the Treasury about concerns about the uh, Memorandum of Understanding being too restrictive and lacking in clarity. Um, has there been any further movement in that in the recent time that uh, the negotiations have covered, or is that part of the area that's been agreed to? On the, uh, on the provisions within the Scotland Bill, no. Um, the United Kingdom government has maintained its position on the Scotland Bill, and the committee will be familiar with the position of the Scottish government in that respect. In relation to the financial provisions, um, we have been involved in negotiations as part of this exercise, and um, the, um, you know, there there is a proposition on the table in relation to the Crown Estate, which, um, uh, you know, again, it's not. Uh, it's not perfect, but uh, it is something that uh, I'm prepared to live with. Okay, I think. Uh, Tavis, do you have any uh, questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Deputy First Minister. I think we've come to the end of our discussions this morning. Um, thank you for giving us your time. Obviously, we have a window of opportunity that's closing us, closing us as far as the solution and uh, Parliament uh, is concerned. Uh, and we would encourage yourself and the UK government to come to a conclusion just as early as you can, so this can, committee can go about its job of scrutinising this, both the fiscal framework and the issues that remain with the Secretary of State and the Scotland Bill on behalf of the people of Scotland, because effectively that's what we're doing. So thank you very much uh, to you and your officials for attending this morning. Thank you. And uh, we meet tonight again in, in, in video conferencing with the Secretary of State. I think the time is 6:45. Thank you. I close this meeting of the committee.